Most breaches are caused by exploiting oversights and basic cybersecurity fundamentals, but complex hybrid multi-cloud infrastructures make cybersecurity hygiene challenging. Red Seal can help. It shows you what's on your network, how it's connected, and the associated risk across public cloud, private cloud, and physical environments. With Red Seal, you'll get control of your cybersecurity fundamentals so you can protect your organization from the inevitable attack vectors and reduce your cyber risk. For more information, visit securityweekly.com forward slash Red Seal. The question is simple. Have any of the systems on my network been compromised? The answer is harder than it should be. Enter AI Hunter. Active Countermeasures has automated and streamlined techniques used by the best pen testers and threat hunters in the industry to create AI Hunter, a network threat hunting solution that does the first pass of a hunt for you to identify systems that are most likely to be compromised and scores the results on a scale from 0 to 100. You can then research those systems in depth with AI Hunter. Focus your valuable time on the systems that need your expertise with AI AI Hunter. Sign up for a personal demo today at securityweekly.com forward slash ACM. Welcome back to Business Security Weekly. I am your host, Matt Alderman, joined by Paul Asadorian and Jason Albuquerque. Attend RSA Conference 2020, February 24th to 28th, and join thousands of security professionals, forward-thinking innovators, and solution providers for five days of actual learning, inspiring conversation, and breakthrough ideas. Save an extra $150 with our discount code. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash RSAC 2020 to register. We will also be recording and broadcast Alley, so please visit that same landing page to book your micro interview or sponsor one of our enterprise shows, which we will be recording from the conference. Also, our next webcast is February 13th with Sri Sundar Lingam. He's the Vice President, Product and Solutions Marketing at ExtraHop, where we will discuss how to pa- uh, how to capture network packets in the cloud. Yes, Paul's working on some just compelling content for that webcast talk about the challenges of network packet capture in the cloud, register by going to securityweekly.com, select the webcast drop down, and click the registration menu item. All right, gentlemen, let's do some articles. We missed you last week, Jason. I missed you, uh, you're too. You are sales kickoff. We so, were kicking off the yes. 2020, the roaring 20s. The roaring 20s, yes. <laughs> <laughs> 100 years later. <laughs> hey, let's bring it back. <laughs> sure. I like those short skirts. Why not? <laughs> I think Jason looked fabulous in a short flapper. skirt. Flapper. I want a flapper. <laughs> yeah, I just want some flapper. All right. So tech isn't the problem or the solution. Look to your own leadership. Uh, I am guilty of number two, by the way. Um, <laughs> the, the article is very interesting yeah. talking about um, technology and productivity and it's not technology is not the problem or the solution. Sometimes it's a leadership. And in sure. the first item is is psychological safety. We've talked a lot about this and the ability for people not to be fearful of getting fired for for raising problems. That's more of a leadership challenge sure. than it is anything else. No, I 100 percent agree. I mean, you know, some of us sitting here stay on 24 7 i mean i'm constantly on doing work i mean it's just part of who i have been my entire career right and and you know i try not to set an example to my uh the folks on my team that i'm expecting that from them right um it, it's how i live my life it's how i'm comfortable always staying connected always responding uh for me it's it's even to the point where i'll i'll schedule emails to go out so it doesn't hit people at certain points of the day where they're going to feel obligated to to communicate back to me right so um i want i want the folks on my team to be able to feel like they can they can open up they have a zone of trust where they can have conversations and say hey listen you know family comes first for me i want my weekends to be as clear as it possibly can obviously we're in it there's emergencies but at the end of the day, on a Saturday or Sunday, when I'm hanging out with my family, I want to be hanging out with my family. So, you know, I, I want to make sure I create a culture where uh, the folks on my team are comfortable doing that, right? Uh, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to have my work habits make them feel obligated to to follow suit. Yeah, I mean, I I get the points in this article. I don't under- necessarily understand how they relate to each other, but psychological safety is important right and yeah. i think we've I mean, talked that's... about that in a much better context than this, <laughs> this article talks ah. about it right and i yeah. you know i whether it's in a slack channel or mm-hmm. whether it's in a meeting you know we we've said in the past like you all have to come together come to a decision sure. whatever happened the meeting happened but when we come out we're all on the same page mm-hmm. right and no yep. one should be 
and, and something's been covered in, in countless books, right? Um, that the need to speak out needs to be, you, you can't have people fearful exactly. about speaking out. And I think that covers more than just communication and being on 24-7. It's anything. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's right. uh, basically as a leader, I have an open door policy where anybody on the team, no matter your role, no matter your title, can come knock on my door and have an open conversation with me, right? Whether it's personal, yeah. whether it's work-related, no matter what it may be, I want to make sure that I'm connected and they feel comfortable having those hard conversations with me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I and think they tried to tie this. Yeah, and I think they tried to tie yeah. this into the second point, which I'm horrible at, which is, mm-hmm. you know, I do a lot of work on the weekends. Mm-hmm. It's when I get some of my work done, and and what they're saying is, look, you're setting an example that it's an right. expectation. It's not, but because you're doing it, others expect that they have to reply on a Saturday or sure. a Sunday, and then they're worried about speaking out because they might get in trouble. Right. And they were trying, I think they were trying to tie the two together. But like I said, I'm horrible at number two because I, I'm just always on, like you, Jason. Yeah. Right. I'm just, I'm always on. I want to be responsive. I get it. People have home lives and family mm-hmm. and all the other things that, that transpire. But we're so connected now. I, I'm horrible at this. Yeah. One. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm not great at it either. Right. I mean, like I said, I'm, I'm constantly replying and, and working and, and it's just part of my everyday routine. But I think communicating to the teams, letting them know, hey, this is my style. Yeah. I appreciate your style. It's all good, right? I mean, yeah, I think we just know this is part of how I operate. And have to let people have their yeah, own style. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and be open to having you know people having their own style. Well, it's just team. like a conversation. Some people work better in the morning. Some people work better late at night, right? Yeah, it's allowing absolutely. people to be productive. Like and, you, Matt, work great. You know, responding right. to emails on Saturday. You know, other That's people it. find all their time to do that, right? And do different things yeah. on weekends. I so, mean, those yeah. those same folks who are like, listen, I want my weekends to, to, to myself and my family are the ones that are responding at 1 a.m. during a weekday. Right. Yeah, I mean, exactly. it's, it, right. it, it, exactly. you know, and that's, I want to create an environment where they're going to be productive in the best times for them. Yes. And then, the and then respect that they have their own home life, right? Their own personal life, have that level of respect as a leader. It's not always a constant uh, either. Right. It's, it's right. Never. <laughs> it never <laughs> is. Never. I mean, it, we'd say that in the most general terms, too, because right. sometimes I am working weekends, sometimes mm-hmm. I am working late, and it's just all the schedule changes, especially when you have uh, family at home, your schedule changes exactly. a lot. So I don't, you know, you can't expect anyone to work the same way all the time oh, either. Right. Especially with the week you had. <laughs> <laughs> It was really hard for me to get worked on this weekend, let me tell you. <laughs> Sick kiddos, never mm-hmm. good. Yep, never good. Uh, obviously, we lost a legend, Kobe Bryant, yeah. but I thought this was a very interesting article on some of his quotes and the, kind of the way he led his life. I think these are great things for all of us and leaders to really embrace. I, I mean, he just, just some of the thoughtfulness of, of these quotes I thought was interesting. And I said, wait, we can all learn from this. So I pulled this article in. Um, just because I, I mm-hmm. thought they were good for us to, to kind of reflect and, and talk about. Yeah, and I mean, um, so, somebody like Kobe, I mean, not only was he just an athletic superstar, he was just a great human being he was. at the end of the day. Yeah. I mean, you look at some of these so athletes, and some out. of them are just, they can be jerks, right? They can, you know what I mean? He just, he wasn't that. He was a, you know, a great athlete, a great person, a great businessman, and just kind of good all-around human being. So, yeah, a, a lot of these quotes, you know, rang home, and yeah, I looked at them and saying, wow, I, well, you you know, know, some of these I need to focus on. You know, when he says <laughs> half-hearted work won't pay off, yeah. and my grandfather yeah. used to say similar things, like you get out of something what you put into it, mm-hmm. right? Yep. So, you know, people that were leaders in my life, you know, our leaders in my life say a lot of the same things. That one really, yeah. you know, hitting home, certainly. Yeah. Like, yeah. if you're going to do something, do it. You know, don't. 100%. You Go know, all in, yeah. And I think that ties into number eight, right? Being lazy comes with a cost. Sure, 100%. <laughs> right? and, and don't accept Absolutely. failure. I mean, it's one of those things where, you know, if, if you fail at something, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, learn from it, and, and go at it one more time, right? You know, that's that never quit attitude. Even if you fail, learn from that, you know? I will get a deployment to ECS, and every time I've tried it so far, it has failed wildly. <laughs> <laughs> and but you I'm won't learning. accept it. <laughs> and I'm not going to accept it. <laughs> right. right. Everyone's like, we need to try like a different... You know, techn- I'm like, no, this, I should be able to run my damn containers here. Yeah. And yeah. Anyway. Wait, well, I like the last one, learn from the best. I mean, yeah. mm. this is, he was one of the best athletes out there. I mean, this is really hard for somebody at his level mm-hmm. to really figure out how to learn from the best when you're considered one of the best. Now, obviously he did it in, in other parts of his life, but as, as a basketball star, I mean, sure. 
how much higher do you go? Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, the, the key bullet points I took out of that is learn from the people you admire, mm. right? Because maybe he's not learning on how to be a better athlete. Maybe he's learning how to be a better human, right? right? And, and, and be that level of an athlete while staying a true, um, you know, uh, human with integrity and, and, and empathy. And, you know what I mean? Because that's how I looked mm-hmm. at Kobe, you know? There's, there's certain uh, athletes that I look at that I just, I don't, I don't like their personalities. And mm-hmm. he was one that just had an incredible personality. Well, I, I think, you know, some of the best career advice that, that we give is to, you know, find a mentor or latch mm-hmm. on to people in environments where you get to work with people who are better than you and are yeah. coaching you, right? And that's always in my career advice 100%, for everyone, 100%. especially in this field, right, yeah. where there's so many different things that you, you have to learn to be in certain positions here. You know, of course, there's technical, non-technical, yep. but we're dealing with a lot of different aspects in security, right? Mm-hmm. And... Uh, I think to to get good at a, a set to have a career path, you really have to surround yourself with people 100%. who have been through it before. Yeah, right. Yeah. The the only other one I pulled out of here that that I really said can be very very beneficial to leaders um, is success demands sacrifice. Right. And it's it's for me it's more of a proactive mindset when I when I read this. It's know what you want to achieve. But at the end of the day, know what you're willing to give up yeah. to get to that level, right? That's great. And, and, I well think, and I think if you have that mindset of what you're willing to sacrifice and you're not willing to sacrifice, you'll have that, that compass that you can always live by. Do you know what I mean? Well, yeah, we've said it in terms of a startup, right? Like some folks want to go off on their own mm-hmm. and be, you know, single person consultant, yeah. you know, want to just, you know, manage yourself, go, you know, from job to job and, uh, you know, consulting job to consulting job and maintain that um kind of wholly owned uh consulting service Mm -hmm. for themselves that's great that's awesome there are other people that start that and want to be on the fast track to you know taking funding and uh you know pushing in in constant growth and and doing the startup life which arguably is a much more higher level of sacrifice absolutely right i mean you look at a lot of startup founders and you read you know their stories there is a lot of sacrifice neither one is right or wrong right but like what jason said it's all about knowing what you're willing to give up right right and and in my fear is that some folks go into a certain mindset and they don't really realize the level of sacrifice it's Mm going to take to get there and either it creates issues at home with their family issues at you know at their career and now that now they're torn for me, it's go into it proactive, learn about as much as you can of what type of sacrifices it's going to take to mm-hmm. get you there because nothing in life is free. There's always going to be trade-offs, right? So just, just go into it knowing. And, and for me, you know, I, I always go into it saying I have a pecking order, right? I, I really do, and I live by my pecking order. Family is top tier, no doubt about it. Mm-hmm. I'm never going to let my career or, or an organization that I work for affect my family. Not going to happen. I'll leave a job if that's the case, right? Mm. So just knowing that that really hard and fast pecking order of what you're willing to sacrifice, you go in, you go in proactive. Yeah, things you need to know as you're interviewing, getting ready to go to a job, mm-hmm. you re- you make sure that pecking order aligns uh, right. to where you go next right. because those are interesting challenges. Mm-hmm. Uh, this research topic I thought was really interesting. This probably hits home to you, Jason, as well, is how to build trust with your business partners from other cultures. And I thought the research was interesting of what other cultures look for to build those partnerships. So some interesting research here. Yeah, it was great. I mean, they looked at it in in a couple of factors, right? Um, You know, cultures, what they're what they're willing to give as far as, you know, trusting each other. And then, you know, how, how tight or loose that culture is in accepting it, right? So, for, for example, you know, they looked at North American and European cultures as, as, as open, open cultures, meaning we're going to operate under that principle of I'm going to trust you innately until you give me a reason to not trust you, right? So it's, it's having that more, um, that more open and trust, trustworthy um, mm-hmm. type scenario where, you know, contrary to that, you look at the Middle Eastern and the South Asian cultures, and it's about respect, it's, you know, I'm going to verify first and then I'm going to trust you. So it's almost polar opposite, right? So, you, so going into conversations with folks, depending on where in the world they are and what, what, what their culture looks at um, for success criteria, let's call it, or trust criteria, y- you communicate differently. Right. So so in those aspects, you know, if in dealing with Middle Eastern culture, you would talk about your competencies, right? Prove that you have the chops mm-hmm. for what it takes. So that way they're verifying right out of the gate that they can trust you and trust your ability. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. How, do you know how they did the research? Was this surveys or 
Yeah, it was survey. Yeah. I think eighty-eight people across thirty-two mm -hmm. different companies. Something. I. The, yeah. the it sounded like they conducted a series of interviews to to come up with that. Yeah, and I thought what, one was interesting. Latin America, right? It's it's more about kind of. Uh, your your personal values yeah. that then transcend over into the business side, right? So they want to know more about you personally and do your values align yeah. kind of at the personal social level before they engage with you on a business um, yeah. perspective. Yeah, I mean, so. it's funny, you know, reading the article, it's like, all right, we're going to go out to dinner and just get to know each other right? to see if we can do business with each other because, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I want, I want to get to know you as a person right? versus, you know, the, the competency levels or anything like that. So uh, I think that was very, very unique and cool. Yes. I threw a couple leadership articles in here, some changes at, at the C-level. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the Discover one was a little interesting, CIO coming in to work on efficiency. It kind of hits home for me and Paul on all the operational efic efficiencies we're bringing in, right? Yeah. Is that, you know, you're definitely seeing a trend to continue to streamline operations and, and create efficiency um, in these hires. I thought the second one was actually a little more interesting on um, – uh, one of uh, VML's uh, conversation on some of the things he learned uh, in his CTO role, yeah. which, which I thought were interesting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're, they're both cool articles, right? I mean, you know, from, from the Discover perspective, they're coming in there and looking at how they can really transform processes to get to get more operational efficiencies using things like robotic process automation, right, and, and deeper analytics and BI. But then I thought the second one was great because it was, they had to take a look introspectively and say, I think we have to outsource less. Which, you know, uh, you know it, it, how, how do you start transitioning from an outsource model to an in-source model and be successful, right? Because there's going to be certain levels of conversations you're having about investment. Because I'm assuming it's, you know, if, if I looked at it this way, I'd be having a conversation with my CEO saying, listen, we're, we're pulling more out of that outsource model and insourcing. It's going to cost us more money, but here's what the, the efficiency or the gains are going to be at the end. Potentially, though. Potentially. And these right. two these right. two definitely interrelate, right? Because yeah. I think a lot of companies that aren't as efficient internally and are using largely legacy technologies mm -hmm. will have a tendency to outsource. Right. 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 But if you use some of the newer technology and processes that are available today yes. as they relate to IT and development, now you can pull those things back in house. If it provides, in my opinion, a better service mm -hmm. to your customers, which usually doing things internally does and not yep. leaving it to the outsourced sure. company, Absolutely. you have more control over the customer, your own right. customer's journey, right? And providing them a better service. Yep. So I think these two definitely they relate. Do. I think we've seen a big push towards outsourcing. I think with the new technologies mm -hmm. and processes, we're going to see a lot of companies taking Bring it that back stuff home. back home. A absolutely. But in, in the challenge here of creating a culture um, to bring those people in and get mm. them excited about mm. the organization and, and coming in-house, right, and a, attracting talent because you've you've been outsourcing that function maybe yep. for a period of time. Now you now you have to create a culture that you those people want to come work for you and stay right. and build that in, a kind of in-house culture. It's why we see so many companies wanting that startup culture, yeah. right, because they want to attract talent. Mm -hmm. Oh, agreed. These are all pages from the Unicorn Project too. It's an aspect of that of uh, that story is the struggling legacy company, right? Yeah. That is, you know, traditionally, uh, it's really the threat of outsourcing in yeah. that story that causes internal groups to create that more startup-like environment where mm -hmm. they can really easily cut through the red tape, use new technologies and processes to sure. get um, projects out that will help them attract mm -hmm. new talent. That's something that the book doesn't focus too much on is how they're able to that cultural transformation is helping them attract new talent. So, yeah. yeah. So this last article I had to pull in here, it popped up on my list. Uh, we, we did a segment on this uh, uh, last Thursday on Paul Security Weekly talking about zero trust. And this article is interesting. It says, for zero trust to work, machines uh, and humans require identities. But it misses one key point. So this is where I take uh, a, a little issue with this article it says the security method challenges traditional notions of identity management because it includes people devices and machines it also includes software mm -hmm. and that's the one piece that was missing in this article yeah. that i wanted to point out is because we hear a lot about the human and the machine identity but software right. and the application have identities that play into the zero trust model and i think it's even broader than this article points out yeah, yeah i think machine's the wrong the wrong term sure. here because sure. what what is a machine is that define it an right. EC2 instance? Is that, what what is that? That's right. not a machine. Right. 
there's maybe a machine identity that is more and more becoming more obscured and it's like Matt's saying it's more about mm -hmm. the application the ma the machines that are running my application yeah. are somewhere in Amazon or Google's or you know Microsoft's cloud but I'm managing mm -hmm. the application what what does it trust right and that's I think one of the big uh hurdles to overcome you know switching to a containerized environment certainly mm -hmm. comes with thinking about things differently but then as you push to serverless and mm -hmm. and cloud where many are going obviously it's about the identity of the application. What does my application trust? Mm -hmm. That's where I think Edgewise has done a fantastic job of letting people control is the uh, identity of that application. Yeah. yeah, I mean, at the end yeah. of the day, I think we have to think a little bit more broadly and say it's the identity of the asset. And name yeah. your asset. Yeah. Is the asset the human? Is the asset the software? Is the asset your S3 bucket? Mm -hmm. <laughs> is it your IoT device? You're trusting, device? You're trusting, is it an the, IoT device? You're trusting the entire right. internet with S3. S3. <laughs> S3 bucket. That is not correct. Right. Right, exactly. Services are mm -hmm. have an identity to 100%. them. All my IoT yep. devices have identities to them. This becomes this whole interdependency of all these identities mm -hmm. and what's allowed to communicate with what or That's what right. should communicate to what. That's what creates zero trust. And like I said, this article just misses out on yeah. a couple key components that I think are important. As the executives are looking at this, you got to think about services yep. and applications and software as part of that model. And, and that's why zero trust is say easy, do hard. Because you really have to get deep into your asset management, well, not just physical assets. But I think services is an interesting aspect yeah. because I think historically services have been available to everyone. If you're on the network, if you're a person, if you're an application, if you're a machine, you have access to DNS services, DHCP services, mm -hmm. right? All these other services. When we start with the micro segmentation, mm -hmm. now we have control over those who should access and exactly. what levels of control do we have to the service? Because now it's not a machine that's running a process, mm -hmm. right? It's a service that's in that's the cloud. Right. Who has access to my API gateway mm -hmm. and which service in, in what level? Is this just read? Is this write? What data they have access sure. to? Yeah. Right. And if we think about the, the segment we just did with David and cascading attacks, mm -hmm. if we can limit that mm -hmm. crossover, we can limit cascading attacks. Exactly right. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And we'll see you next week on Business Security Weekly.